that DNA cloning is a technique for amplifying and or expressing DNA fragments. And there are two basic approaches that you can follow here. First, of course, is what is known as the in vivo or cell-based method, which is also the focus of the lecture today, where you can not just amplify the DNA. If required, you can also express the protein from the DNA fragment that you have cloned. And then the second method here is your in vitro or PCR-based method. So this amplification happens outside a living cell, and therefore it's called the in vitro method. And what you use here is a polymerase chain reaction, which we'll be discussing in a later lecture in more details. Another important point of distinction between in vivo and in vitro methods of uh, DNA amplification is in in vitro method, only the amplification of DNA can happen. Expression does not happen here. Now, as an activity, I ask you a question here. So PCR represents an in vitro method for DNA amplification and expression. You got to answer whether this is true or false. And uh, if you look at the question here, it is a method for DNA amplification that is right, but you cannot express the DNA using PCR. So which means then that this is actually a false statement. So there are three key players in uh, cell-based DNA cloning. Uh, the vector insert and the host cell, right? The first most important player is, of course, the vector, which is also your transport and replication vehicle. Usually, this will be a double-stranded closed circular DNA, which will also integrate your DNA of interest. Uh, a vector is required to carry the DNA fragment of interest, which is also your insert into the host cell. And multiple copies of the insert are formed as the vector replicates independent of the host cell and also as the host cell multiplies itself. So the amplification happens in two ways. One is that the vector is autonomous and can replicate independently of the host cell DNA. So therefore it keeps replicating by itself and in a much quicker rate as compared to the host DNA. And then of course, as the cell divides, the vectors also divide and continue its replication in the daughter cells. And therefore the amplification is exponential. The second key player in the cell-based cloning system is the insert. So insert is a piece of DNA that you want to amplify. And if it is coming from a coding region, you might also want to express the protein from it. So therefore, vector insert compatibility is of critical importance. As you go through the lecture, you'll be able to notice that vectors have evolved to accommodate the varying properties of the insert. So as I said, insert is a DNA of interest to be cloned for multiplication or expression. So the third most important player in this uh, cell-based cloning system is the host cell itself. Host cell is a cell in which your recombinant vector will be resident and is going to amplify and also express the, the DNA of interest if required. The host cell has to ensure that it is compatible to both the vector and the insert. And as we go through the lecture, you realize that the strategies to ensure that the recombinant vector in the host cell is identified include modification of the host cell DNA itself. So in a cell-based cloning system, it is the nature of the insert that defines which vector and which type of host cell are you going to use for your cloning experiment. So let me take you through the steps in cell-based cloning. And this would essentially define also what are the prerequisites that must be there in a vector to ensure efficient cell-based cloning, right? So the first step here is the preparation of insert. And I've already told you that sticky end ligation or staggered end ligation is a lot easier and more efficient than blunt end ligation. Linkers, adapters, and hemopalmetilin are some of the methods that you can use to introduce uh, staggered ends onto your blunt end insert. The next step now is the preparation of vector. And amongst preparation of vector, the first important point is to select the vector. And which vector will be used for the, for the cloning experiment will depend on the insert size. Also, the objective of the experiment, whether you want to go for uh, for just the amplification of DNA or you also want to uh, to express the protein of interest. So therefore, depending on that, you'll have to decide which vector to use. So most vectors are circular and you have to open them up using a restriction enzyme. Now, which restriction enzyme to use to open this vector would depend on, again, what are the staggered ends present on your insert. So therefore, the choice of restriction enzyme that you use to open up your vector for creating a place where the insert can be ligated depends largely on the nature of the insert, right? And as we go down, I'll tell you that this is an important point where uh, modifications in the 
naturally acting, occurring vectors are made so as to ensure that any type of insert can be accommodated here, right? So the next important point is ligation and ligation essentially means that you're opening up your vector and you're now integrating stably by means of phosphodiester bonds, your insert into the vector here, right? So this is your ligation here. You have your vector, which is now open and then you have your insert, which is accordingly modified so as to ensure efficient ligation. And then you use ligase and you get a recomb recombinant vector so a recombinant vector is a vector in which the insert is stably integrated into the vector here, right? And there are additional complications here that we will discuss as we go along in the lecture. So once the ligation is successful, you have a recombinant vector and this recombinant vector has to be forced into the host cell, right? And there are methods of ensuring that the recombinant vector is easily able to enter into the host cell. These include heat shock, electroporation, and gene gun. And we've discussed this earlier, so we'll not discuss it here. But just to give you an idea, this is your transformation process where the recombinant vector comes into the host cell. And there are complications here as well, because not just the recombinant vector, it could be the non-recombinant vector that can also come in here. Uh, and therefore, the vector must have enough strategies to ensure that you are able to select the host cells that contain recombinant vector. So therefore, to ensure that you are able to pull out the transformed cells with recombinant plasmids, there are methods of selection. So you could have an activation of resistance, you could have color-based selection, and we'll discuss each of these one more time. So once the recombinant vector is inside the host cell, it is going to divide and produce multiple copies of your, of your original DNA that you started with the insert. And then, of course, as the cell divides, you will have further amplification of your DNA. So with that background, let's look at the variations that can be present in insert and that may force a certain selection of, uh, of the vector for your cell-based cloning experiment. So while designing a cell-based cloning experiment, the driving force is the insert. The reason why the insert is central to defining which vector and which type of host cell will be used for your cell-based cloning experiment is that the insert is highly variable. And if you look at the variation in insert, first of course is insert size. The insert could be as small as 100 base pairs or even smaller, or it could be as large as 150 KB, 250 KB, 300 KB, and so on and so forth, right? And you could also have intermediate sizes like 10 KB, 20 KB, and so on and so forth. So one of the primary determinants of compatibility between the vector and the insert is the insert size. And not all sizes can fit in the same vector. So depending on the size of the insert, the vectors that can be utilized for amplifying them are different. So the variability in the insert size also allows for variability in the vector that will be compatible with them. So as you can see here, if the size of the insert is less than six kilobases, then plasmids are the best vector that can be used for amplification and or expression of the DNA. If it is between six to 22 kilobases, then of course, lambda path is the next vector series that you can pick up. There are other vectors in the series that we'll discuss as we move along. But if the insert size is too large, let's say greater than 100 kilobases or more, then of course you, can, you have to use artificial uh, chromosomes and artificial chromosomes include your bacterial artificial chromosomes, yeast artificial chromosomes and mammalian artificial chromosomes. So choice of the vectors is clearly dependent on the size of the insert that you start with. The other important method in which the inserts can differ from each other is the ends of the insert. So here you are, this is your blunt end insert. It doesn't have any single standard overhangs at either ends, and not all vectors are compatible with blunt end inserts. Then of course you have uh, the other type of insert that is having staggered ends. And if you can see here, there are two different staggered ends here. And this allows for the insertion of this piece of DNA in a directional manner in the vector, right? And therefore, again, uh, depending on what is the nature of the insert that you have, you may want to you may want to select a specific type of vector. Uh, as I've already told you in previous lectures, in DNA-based cloning or cell-based cloning, what is preferred is a staggered end insert. And there are methods to introduce staggered ends onto the insert. There could also be variability in the insert function. Your insert could be part of a coding region of the genome, in which case it is capable of expressing a protein of interest and therefore in such cases you have to use expression vectors and not the normal uh, cloning vectors and also you have to ensure that there is direction cloning so that 
the promoter and the terminator sequences are in the correct orientation with reference to the insert. You could have an insert that is non-coding, that does not code for a specific protein, and the only purpose of the experiment could be to amplify your piece of DNA. Most commonly, this is done in case of sequencing experiments. Despite the variation, there are certain basic properties common to all vectors, and we'll now move into the details of what these properties are and how they are modified so as to suit the experimental objectors. Here I show you a typical vector. The portion in red represents the insert or the piece of DNA that you want to amplify and or express. And the other part, the black circular part, represents the remaining part of the vector into which your insert has been ligated. Right? So you could have another insert of the same size, but the composition may be very different. You could have another insert that is a small in size or larger in size than the one shown earlier. Then you could also have insert where the orientation of insert becomes important in the experimental objective. More so this happens when you're going for expression of the insert. The, the orientation of the insert in this case is extremely important because the promoter must fly immediately upstream of the first exon and not the other way around. Right? Going to the variability in the insert, the vectors have been evolved so as to accommodate all types of variations in the insert and make them compatible with the insert that you want to amplify and or express. So here is a formal definition of vector. A vector is a small piece of DNA taken from a bacteria or virus or the cell of our organism that can be stably maintained and multiplied in an organism and into which a foreign DNA fragment can be stably inserted for cloning, amplification and expression purposes. And most vectors are naturally like in DNA which have been engineered and customized to maximize ligation and transformation efficiency and to ensure easy selection of recombinants. So let us now look at some of the important features and prerequisites that are required of a vector. So let's go back to the first step of a typical DNA cloning experiment where you first have to open your vector. Most vectors are circular and therefore once you have to, when you have to add the insert into the vector, it has to be opened up. And this opening up of the vector happens via restriction endonucleases. And while the vector may have its own set of restriction endonucleases, they may not be enough to accommodate for the type of inserts that you want to uh, and that you want to ligate to the vector. So therefore, it is also important that the vector has additional restriction sites, and all of these restriction sites are located within one specific stretch of the DNA in the vector. Right? So here you are. This is your uh, let's say a plasmid or a vector for that matter and then the first step here is to open this vector using a restriction in the nucleus right then in the second step which you see you do the ligation so that is uh, basically the process of generation of recombinant vector so you have a linearized vector which has been opened at the restriction enzyme site you add your insert and then you use your ligase so as to get a recombinant plasmid and in some cases what will also have is a self ligated non-recombinant plasmid. So while you want to promote this type of ligation reaction, you don't want to promote a self-ligation of the recombinant plasmid. And in the previous lectures, I've told you what modifications you can do to ensure that while this reaction is favored, this one is disfavored. So the point where the insert is inserted into the vector is of critical importance. Uh, and therefore, instead of a random region where you would want to insert your uh, DNA of interest, what you do is you define a specific region within the vector where insertion can happen. And this region is basically characterized by the presence of a large number of recombination sequences for multiple restriction enzymes, both staggered ended and blood intended. And we already know that the staggered end ligation is preferred over blunt end ligation. Right? So this region, which contains a large number of recognition sequences for restriction enzymes, is referred to as NCS or multiple cloning site, also known as polylinker, where you have a richness of recognition sequences of a large number of restriction enzymes. These enzymes could be both blunt end as well as staggered end. So the vectors are engineered to have a multiple cloning site or a polylinker, which contains a series of recognition sequences for different restriction enzymes. Right? And that helps in accommodating any type of, uh, any type of insert with any type of uh, uh, restriction line ends. It also helps to ensure directional cloning as we'll see in the next slide here. 
So let's say the objective of your experiment is to be able to express your insert. So here is your insert. This is your exon one, exon four. And here is your vector on the top strand. Here is the promoter and here is the termination sequence. So essentially now here, you can only have the insert in this place here to ensure that expression happens. Also, what is important is the orientation in which the insert ligates to the vector here, right? So you could have two possible ways in which the insert can ligate here. One is where the exon one is immediately downstream of the promoter sequence on the vector and exon four is immediately upstream of the terminator sequence on the vector, which is the correct orientation. The other orientation in which the insert can fit in is this one here, where uh, it is the, the insert is flipped and now you have exon four next to promoter and exon one next to the terminator. So this position obviously is incorrect and will not fetch you the desired protein. So therefore, you must have a mechanism to ensure that the actual ligation happens only in this uh, direction and not in the opposite direction. So this is what is known as directional cloning. And one way of ensuring the directional cloning is to ensure that uh, your, there are different uh, overhangs on the end of your insert. And here in this case, again, the multiple cloning site or the MCS comes in really handy. Right? So here is your insert and the insert has been so modified so as to have different staggering ends at the top and the bottom strand of your insert. So here in this case at the top strand 5' end you have a BAM H1 and at the bottom strand 5' end you have an eco R1 over high. So what you do is since you know that your insert has a BAM H1 and eco R1 over high, you double digest your vector with BAM H1 and eco R1 generating complementary ends in the correct orientation, right? So here you have your dimension complementary end. Likewise, here at this end next to the terminator, you have an eco R1 complementary end. And now this is very easy to ligate because that the only way the ligation can happen is when the insert fits in here in this orientation and not in the opposite orientation. So here you are. This is how your ligation is going to happen with complementary ends of the two end lines uh, aligning to each other forming hydrogen bonds and then of course once they are aligned and they are stabilized the formation of phosphorester bond by ligase becomes a lot easier here right so therefore complementary stagger ends ensure stable positioning better efficiency of ligation and directional cloning and all this is possible because you had a multiple cloning site here where you had multiple sequences of multiple restriction and lines and you chose to digest your vector with damage one and eco r1 so therefore, multiple cloning site in the MCS makes the plasmid modular, allowing any insert to be ligated, ensuring directionality if required, right? So this is the advantage of having a multiple cloning site. So almost all vectors that you use have a pre-designed and pre-engineered multiple cloning site, having recognition sequences for a large set of restriction enzymes. So the MCS is designed keeping the heterogeneity of the insert in mind, and there are multiple restriction sites within the MCS so as to ensure whatever combination of restriction sites are present in the insert, a corresponding complementary ends can be generated in the vector. This also ensures efficient ligation as well as ensures the orientation, the required orientation in the ligation reaction. So therefore, MCS is an important part of all vectors and it is typically engineered to contain a large number of recognition sequences for both staggered as well as blunt end restriction enzymes to ensure modularity and versatility in the vector. Now let's look at the next step, which is your transformation reaction. And transformation reaction is again very important. Efficiency of transformation is of critical importance for successful accomplishment of experimental objectives. So transformation is a process by which an organism acquires exogenous DNA. In our case, we're looking at the acquisition of vector and especially you're looking at the acquisition of a recombinant vector. So remember when you have your reaction mix, you'll have both your recombinant vector and you'll have your non-recombinant vector and both will have equal chance to get inserted into the host cell. And if you remember from previous lectures, there are several mechanisms by which you could ensure that the host cell is receptive for the incoming exogenous DNA and the most common methods used are electroporation where you give an electric shock to the host cell during which time the membrane is permeable to exogenous DNA. Or you could also use a heat shock where you keep the cells in, in low temperature for a very long time, let's say zero degrees centigrade. 
and then of course for a very brief period of time they are transferred back to high temperatures of let's say 37 to 43 degrees centigrade depending on the vector you're using and then brought back again within the next two minutes to zero degrees centigrade so during this time the cells undergo heat shock and in the heat shock the cells are more permeable to the incoming foreign dna which in this case happens to be a recombinant plasmid or a non-recombinant plasmid so after the transformation experiment is successful you get three populations of cells so the first type of cells are the cells that undergo successful transformation with the recombinant vector so here is your vector with your dna of interest inserted into it right the second type of cells that you get are the ones that take up the non-recombinant vector so here you are while the transformation has happened it is not what you had desired for so this is not the cell that you're looking for and then of course the third type of cells that you have are the non-transformants where the transformation does not take place and therefore you do not have a vector here neither the recombinant vector nor the normal vector here now the challenge is also to have a mechanism to ensure that you are able to unambiguously identify these cells and the ones that carry your recombinant vector versus the cells that do not carry your recombinant vector versus the cells that have not undergone any kind of transformation so here you are this is your recombinants the top one the second one are your non-recombinants and the third one are your non-transformants you must have a mechanism to ensure that you are able to clearly and unambiguously identify these cells these are the ones that offer interest and have to be taken forward for the experimentation these two can be rejected at this point so a very important property of the vector is to have a marker to select for transformants so one very common property of vectors that is used to distinguish between non-transformants and transformants is the resistance that the vector can confer on the host cell right so in most common plasmids there are two uh, resistance genes one is for tetracycline resistance and the other is for ampicillin resistance since the non-transformants do not have a vector so therefore these will be tetracycline sensitive as well as ampicillin sensitive then we come to the second part here where we have transformants and this one is a non-recombinant transformant where both the genes of the uh, of the vector are intact so in which case these cells would be both tetracyclines as well as ampicillin resistant in case of recombinants the mcs is put into the tetracycline gene so because the mcs is in the tetracycline gene in case of recombinants the tetracycline resistance is lost right so therefore the recombinants here would have tetracycline sensitivity and ampicillin resistance right? so as you can very clearly see both transformants are ampicillin resistant while the non-transformants are ampicillin sensitive so when you plate out your transformants onto an ampicillin positive plate which means that the plate has ampicillin only the recombinants and non-recombinants which are the two transformants will grow the non-transformants will not be able to grow on this plate here so that is the first level selection you have already eliminated the non-transformants and now you're looking you're taking forward only the transformants here and as you can clearly see there are two population of transformants here the green ones represent your true recombinants and the blue ones represent your uh, non-recombinants which have the vector but they do not have the insert along with the vector so with so the vectors must also have an inbuilt mechanism to select transformants from non-transformants and resistance conferred by plasma is the most common method to segregate transformants from non-transformants so now that you have a population of non-recombinant and recombinant transformants there must also be a mechanism inherent in the vector so as to ensure that you're able to identify which of these colonies are recombinants and which of these colonies are non-recombinants right and uh, that essentially means that there must be a marker in the vector itself to select for recombinant transformants and most commonly this is done by what is known as blue white screening and very clearly amongst the transformants the white colonies represent your recombinants and the blue colonies represent your non-recombinants and we'll come to the mechanism of this when we discuss about plasmids in details based on the functionality of large z gene uh, which codes for beta galactosidase we'll of course go into the details of this as we talk of plasmids so the vectors must also have an inbuilt mechanism to select recombinant transformants from non-recombinant transformants resistance based selection or color based selection are the two options that are available of course the color based selection is one step process while the resistance based selection is a two step process
So let's say you're finally selected for your uh, recombinant transformants. The other important property of the vector that is most critical to the successful uh, completion of the DNA cloning experiment is the fact that the vector must be able to replicate autonomously. So all vectors must contain an origin of replication, uh, which is the point from where the replication of the vector starts and then spreads over to the entire vector. Then origin of replication are sequences in genome where replication actually begins and proceeds. Regions of uh, genome that recruit replication proteins are generally AT rich and single origin of replication is found in prokaryotic vectors and there could be multiple origin of replications in eukaryotes and these can be modified to enhance the efficiency of replication. So some of the important properties a molecule must have to ensure that it, it can work as an efficient vector include a multiple cloning site or polylinker or what is also known as a combination of suitable unique restriction sites. This is important because the insert itself may be highly variable, right? And therefore the vector must be modular so as to ensure any kind of restriction ends that uh, uh, insert may have, you are able to generate suitable complementary restriction ends in the vector. Then next important thing is that there must be a selectable marker to indicate successful transformation, you should be able to clearly distinguish between the true transformants and the non-transformants and most commonly this is done with the means of a resistance uh, gene, right, which is present in the plasma. Then of course among the transformants you should be able to clearly and unambiguously identify the ones that contain your recombinant plasmid versus the ones that do not contain your recombinant plasmid. And ideally, this should happen in a one-step reaction. As we look into the evolution of vectors, we'll see that initially it was a two-step reaction. And finally, with the help of beta electricities, this was made into a one-step single color screening of blue and white colonies. White colonies are the recombinants. The blue colonies are the non-recombinants. And then, of course, there has to be, uh, to ensure efficient replication of your DNA of interest, there has to be an uh, origin of replication in your vector that allows for independent autonomous and quick replication of your vector uh, independent of the host DNA. So with this brief on vectors and the important prerequisites that a vector must have to ensure its uh, functionality, we now move on and look at the journey of evolution of vectors as we have moved along over the years.